All right, welcome back, everyone. In this section, I'm going to talk about using the CAPM in the real world. So last video, we talked about the theory of the CAPM. I introduced the model form of the CAPM, and we talked about the security market line. In this video, we're actually going to apply the CAPM. We're going to estimate beta. We're going to do a lot of cool stuff. Uh, so let's talk about, talk about what we're going to do. So I'll start off introducing you to the other form of the CAPM called the regression form. I'll talk about why we seek alpha, which is a very important concept in investments. And then I'll use a spreadsheet example to show you how we calculate alpha and beta using just some real world data. Okay, here we go. Now the regression form of the CAPM is a little different than our model form. Remember with our model form, we had this R sub I on the left hand side, but this risk free rate R sub F, it was over here on the right hand side. We also didn't have an alpha and we didn't have an error term. So let me just walk through what we're looking at here. Uh, what this regression form of the CAPM says is that uh, the risk premium on a certain stock, so the difference between a stock's return and the risk free rate should be equal to some alpha plus beta times the market risk premium plus an error term. Uh, this return right here, R sub I, this is just the stock's return on in a given period, say like a given month. We subtract from that the risk-free rate in a given month, say the yield on a T-bill in a given month. And then over here we have our alpha. Now alpha is, it's the intercept in this linear regression. It's a very important concept. When we get to it, what you're gonna see is that alpha is a good indicator of whether this stock outperformed what it was expected to offer based on its level of market risk. If we have a positive alpha, what that indicates is that this stock outperformed what it was expected to offer during the period, say like the year. Next we have beta. And just like last video, beta indicates market risk. The higher the beta, the more market risk the stock is exposed to. Here, inside the parentheses, we have our market risk premium. Return on the market, usually the S&P 500 index, minus the risk-free rate. Again, probably a T-bill. And lastly, we have something we didn't have in the model form. That is the error term. Now the error term, the reason it exists is because we're going to run a linear regression. And to do that, we're going to have time series data, say like 60 observations. And in each of these observations, we're going to have a different return on a security, a different risk-free rate, a different market return. And then we'll be estimating an alpha and a beta. The alpha and the beta will be the same, but for every observation, uh, these numbers, R sub I, R sub F, R sub M, they're gonna change. The error term exists to balance these two sides of the equation, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. I'll show you the error terms when we get to Excel, but you could just take it uh, you know, on faith that I I'm telling you the truth right now. So this error term, this is the error term for stock I at time T. Okay. Now let's talk a little more about alpha. Now alpha, it's again, I've said, it's a very important concept. Our alpha tells us by how much the stock or the portfolio outperformed what the cap M expected it to offer during the period. So let's say, you know, we have a, a cap M and we know that the risk-free rate is 4% and the beta of the stock in question is uh, one, uh, just one. So, you know, if you have a beta of one and you've got a market risk premium of 6%, for example, and your risk-free rate is 4%, uh, this stock is expected to have a 10% return during the year. But let's say instead of having a 10% return, it actually has a 16% return during the year. So it's expected return is 10%. It's actual return is 16%. Well, the alpha is that difference. It's the 16% of the actual return minus the 10% of the expected return. In other words, this stock outperformed by 6%. Because the alpha is positive, it tells us that this stock outperformed what the cap M predicted it would offer in the way of return. On the other hand, uh, we can have negative alphas. So let's say, oh, we have a stock that has a beta of two 
and uh, you know, still the same T bill rate. But uh, during the year, this stock was expected to offer a 16% return, and it actually offered a 10% return. That alpha of negative six tells us this stock underperformed what it was expected to offer investors given its level of market risk, proxied by a beta of two. Okay, let's try a CFA question. Uh, which of the following is most likely to be the primary determinant of expected return of an individual asset in the cap M? Is it the asset's beta, the asset's standard deviation, or the asset's risk premium? Well, I'm not going to highlight it, but the, the correct answer here is beta. Uh, the asset's beta is the primary determinant of the expected return. Uh, different assets will all have the same risk premium or the market risk premium, uh, but every asset will have this, uh, a different beta. So the higher the beta, the higher the expected return. So you know, beta of 2 indicates that we should have a higher expected return than a beta of 0.5. Okay, now I have one additional question before we start to get into some of the more complicated stuff. Uh, in 2023, let's say that Tesla had an 18.25% return. The firm's beta was 1.65 and the S&P 500 was expected to have a 9.5% return. And the yield on the 10-year T-note was 5.25%. What was Tesla's alpha? So this is a question that you know you could see on a CFA level one exam. Uh, it's a very basic question that involves the regression form of the cap M. So let's use the regression form of the cap M to calculate Tesla's alpha. So here's our regression form of the cap M. Uh, so you know, return on a stock minus risk free rate equals alpha plus beta times market risk premium plus error term. Now. If we want to rearrange this, we could certainly do so. Uh, error terms, uh, I should probably mention, and you know, this is just kind of a something we just expect. The expected error term is always zero. Uh, errors should balance to zero, uh, so this thing will drop off. What we're left with is, you know, the rest of this equation. And what we can do is we can move this beta times the market risk premium over to the other side, and that's where we get alpha as a function of this stuff. So, if we know that Tesla had a return of 18.25%, that's our return on, well, stock I. Uh, we also know that the yield on the 10-year T-note was 5.25%, so we slot it in as our risk-free rate. Uh, remember, the yield on a U.S. Treasury security is, I mean, in the United States, it's always going to be our risk-free rate. So, that's what goes there and way over here. Next, we know the beta. And the beta of Tesla was 1.65, so that's going to go right there. And our S&P 500 expected return was 9.5%. That goes right there. All told, we had an alpha of almost 6%. So there we go. What this says is that uh, Tesla absolutely outperformed what it was expected to offer in the way of return based on its level of market risk. Uh, this alpha, this is a fantastic alpha. Really, any alpha that's positive is a good alpha. Okay, now it's time to talk about regression. Now, hopefully you remember regression or something about regression from your statistics class. Here, we're going to apply it, and I mean, it's going to be relatively useful because we're going to use it to estimate the cap M. We're going to use linear regression to calculate alpha and beta. And we're going to do that by taking a large amount of time series data on stock returns and market returns and risk-free rates. Uh, and essentially, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the, uh, the slope and the intercept. So the slope here would be the beta, the intercept would be our alpha. And to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to treat this entire excess return on the left-hand side as our dependent variable. And we're going to regress that on our independent variable, which is everything you see in the parentheses here. This is our market risk premium, or the return on the market minus the risk-free rate. We're going to let the computer determine the alpha and the beta that minimize the sum of these squared errors. That's what regression does. Now, we use regression all the time in the real world, and you know 
the cap M is one of the most fundamental ways in which we use this simple linear regression. Uh, we're going to use it to calculate alpha and beta. And so let's go, let's go through this. Let me show you how we use this regression to estimate this alpha and beta. So what we'll do is we'll work in the cap M tab in our spreadsheet for this week, and we'll calculate alpha or apples, alpha and beta, and you'll get to see how this is done. So I'll move over to the spreadsheet now. Okay. So I'm in the spreadsheet and I've got some historical data on the S&P 500, Apple, and I also threw in Boeing. You'll see why in a second. Uh, let me go ahead and sh shrink some of this stuff up so we can actually uh, see it a little more easily. There we go. And there we go. Okay, so I collected this data and uh, you'll notice that we have monthly data here. Uh, so I collected 60 months or 61 months of data here, or I guess it's only 60 months worth of data. I use 61 months to calculate these returns. And what we're going to do is we're going to calc use this data to calculate Apple's alpha and beta. Now, first things first, we need to calculate the excess return on Apple stock and the excess return on the market proxied by the S&P 500. And the reason we're doing that is because we need our Y variable and we need our X variable. So our Y variable is going to be the excess return on Apple stock and the X variable is going to be the excess return on the market or the excess return on the S&P 500. So first things first, I have a risk-free rate right here. I'm going to take the S&P 500's actual return minus the risk-free rate. And I'm going to copy that formula down by double clicking on the bottom right here. Next, I want Apple's excess return. This is going to be our Y variable, our dependent variable. So it's just Apple's actual raw return minus the risk-free rate. And just for good measure, I'll show you how we build alpha, uh, portfolio alphas and betas here. So I'll just get Boeing as well. So Boeing's excess return is just their raw return minus the risk-free rate. Bam, there we go. Okay, now to calculate our alpha and beta, uh, what I want to do in Excel is use the data analysis tool pack. And the data analysis tool pack, uh, if I go down here to regression, I'm going to be able to regress our Y variable on our X variable. So our Y variable, this is Apple's excess returns. And I highlighted or included the label here, so I just need to check check this label box. Next, I'll use the X variable, and that's just the S&P 500 excess returns. And where do I want to put it? Oh, I'll put it right here where I apparently put it when I was building the spreadsheet. Uh, I'll also show you the residuals and the residual plot, just for good measure. So I think everything is good to go here. You don't have to have all these boxes checked down here. That, that's not important. It's really just I want to show you what those error terms are. So let's click OK. And we have some output. Now, I will absolutely test you on reading Excel output for regressions on our exam. I can trust, I mean, just believe me when I tell you, you will see this stuff on an exam. Uh, so let's go through this stuff. Now, uh, simple linear regression, we regressed one variable on another. And, you know, this, we have some basic statistics. The most important of this is probably going to be our R squared and our adjusted R squared. Uh, this R squared, think of this as the explanatory power. And this is going to be between zero and one. If it's zero, it means that your X variable did not predict, offer any prediction ability with respect to your Y variable. If it's one, it means that your two variables are perfectly positively correlated. You've probably got the same variable there. Uh, so the higher this is, the better. Uh, but you know, if it's one, that leads to all kinds of further issues. Okay, uh, ANOVA, I'll be blunt. I'm hard pressed to think of a useful case for ANOVA in uh, finance. So we're going to skip past all of this stuff and just focus on the most important stuff, the stuff down here. Uh, this intercept and the 
uh, slope with respect to the excess return. Now, this thing right here, this intercept, this is our alpha. And this right here, this is our beta. So there we go. Let me just kind of shrink this up a little. All right, so our alpha is positive, but very close to zero. Uh, our beta is positive and it's greater than one, which is consistent with what we might expect. I think when I showed you alpha, uh, Apple's uh, beta in early 2024 was like 1.3. Uh, during this time period, it was 1.2, so not far off. But basically, it's beta. It, it's got more market risk than the the, the market as a whole. Uh, now, I mentioned R squared and alpha and beta. So alpha is here, beta is here. Uh, one other, two other relatively important components would be the p values or these. These things right here, they tell us the statistical significance of these numbers. Uh, think of them almost like the T statistics that you covered in your statistics class, but the p-values basically tell you the significance level. The smaller it is, the more significant. Uh, so your p-value, if it's below uh, a certain threshold, this indicates significance at that threshold. And you know the standard threshold is 0.05. It indicates significance at the 5% level. Uh, what we see here is a p-value of 0.77, corresponding to a t statistic of 0.30. This tells us that while our alpha is positive, it's not statistically significantly different from zero. Uh, basically, what this p-value and the t statistic and the standard error tell you are the results of a hypothesis test. Is this coefficient statistically significantly different from zero? Uh, in this case, no, because our p-value is greater than 0.05. Now, the p-value of basically zero here tells us that this beta or this x variable is statistically significantly different from zero. In other words, there is explanatory power here. Basically, we reject the null hypothesis that our x variable S&P 500 excess returns are uh, not related to our Y variable, Apple's excess returns. Uh, what this really says is that our S&P 500 excess return is absolutely a predictor variable for Apple's excess returns. Uh, so, you know, very important statements here. Uh, almost always you'll see this p-value for your beta being uh, very, very small, indicating statistical significance. Okay. Finally, down here, we have our residuals. So I mentioned the error terms with respect to our regression form of the CAPM, and I mentioned that we use them to balance observations. Uh, we have 60 observations here that we're using to calculate alpha and beta. And down here, we have 60 residuals or error terms. Now, each of these error terms is the value that when added to our predicted uh, excess return would get us our actual excess return. So let me just give you an example. So let's say we have our alpha plus the beta times, oh, where's our first excess return? There we go. All right, so here we have our uh, our expected. Notice here that it's just exactly the same as this. If I were to add to that our residual, we'd get a, a value here. So, so our actual, once I add the residual, is exactly Apple's excess return. So what I'm trying to get at here is that these error terms balance the left-hand and the right-hand side of the regression form of the cap uh, yeah, that's That's the big takeaway here. Okay, so that's that. Uh, now, one final thing I should point out here, I did have Boeing excess returns. Uh, if I wanted to, I could absolutely calculate a 
portfolios alpha or beta using Boeing and X and Apple. Basically, uh, just the same way we use weighted average returns, we can also use weighted average alphas and betas. Uh, I'm, maybe that's a little over the top right now, but you know, if I wanted to, I could you know, use Apple's alpha and Boeing's alpha and calculate the monthly portfolio alpha given the weights that we have here. And same thing for the betas. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave it to another example. So, yeah, uh, there we go. All right, so let's summarize. Uh, so the CAPM states that there is one risk factor alone that determines an asset's expected return, and it's the market risk pre uh, the market risk factor, the beta. Uh, we talked about alpha, and alpha indicates whether a security outperformed or underperformed based on its beta. Uh, so if we have a positive alpha that indicates that the security outperformed what it was expected to offer based on the cap M. If we have a negative alpha, indi that indicates underperformance based on uh, an, an asset's beta. Uh, we also we use simple linear regression to estimate an asset's market risk, aka its beta and its alpha. And notice that in our example, we used historical data to estimate alpha and beta. Uh, this is just something we have to do to estimate these two things. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.